everyone. Uh, as a disclaimer, um, a lot of the work I'll be talking about is uh, not much more than a week old or so, so this is the first time I'm talking about it, so it won't be as polished, but also feel free to interrupt me if you, uh, if you have questions or if something isn't, isn't uh, quite clear. Um, the, uh, so I will be talking about uh, um, artificial gauge fields in, in the quantum gas microscope. Uh, and then um, I will also give um, a brief overview of some other work that we have been recently doing that also has some connection uh, to um, this topic. So um, our, um, our favorite tool is um, the quantum gas microscope, which allows us to really create a many-body system that is fully controlled. So we can, we can use the microscope to image all individual atoms. Here's a picture, for example, of many, many individual atoms. We have pretty much perfect fidelity in imaging them. Uh, and, um, but then we can also use the microscope in reverse and project potential landscapes. In fact, all the lattices we have been using in the last uh, five or so years, uh, uh, they have always been projected already. But now we can also project arbitrary potential landscapes uh, to make um, um, like a double well or other more fancy structures or like a finite, um, like a box with flat, uh, uh, um, like a flat box with hard walls or, or things like that. That gives us a lot of new possibilities. Um, and uh, uh, right, uh, in particular, we can also um, um, uh, um, initialize few body states. Normally, as a first step, we start with the mod insulator and then we can initialize a few body states with that. Just for, um, as an example, here, for example, we can initialize exactly uh, one row of atoms. And if you then let them tunnel horizontally, uh, uh, we get a quantum walk. But here, if we did a little twist to it, we, we, we tilted the lattice. Classically, you, you would expect the atoms to run down the hill, but of course you all know uh, a Bloch oscillation looks very different. It's actually a completely symmetric motion. And so here we can observe a Bloch oscillation in a 1D lattice, uh, kind of, uh, it, what happens is that the atoms all come back to the original side. So like while they're spread out, they actually delocalize coherently, uh, but then um, the system is pretty much completely coherent, so we can see how the atoms come back to their original site. Okay, so in a, in a bigger picture, we really want to do, uh, we want to create synthetic matter, or we really want to create a model system also for understanding condensed uh, matter kind of um, um, ideas um, and models. The, the analogy is that our atoms in the optical lattice, you can view as a model of what electrons might do in a, in a crystal structure. Uh, there are bosonic atoms, fermionic atoms. I'll be talking about bosonic atoms uh, in the first part um, of the talk. It's much bigger space, and so we can see them individually and control them. Um, let me start talking about uh, very recent work on gauge fields in the lattice. So this, uh, 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 these were the people um, involved in that. Um, Adam Kaufman was leading that as a postdoc, and he's the... The, a fantastic team of graduate students, and you'll actually uh, find um, many of them in the audience right now. Also, if you want to uh, stop by the lab, also just talk to them, okay? They, there would be an opportunity today, for example. Um, okay, so um, as you all know, we are interested in these, uh, in these topological states of matter because it's kind of a new paradigm where, you, uh, where there's no simple order, no simple broken symmetry. Uh, and this gives rise to all this uh, um, fascinating physics we have been talking about here. Um, how can we create gauge fields in the lattice? Uh, or how can we create gauge fields uh, or effective magnetic fields with, with outward cold atoms? We have heard a lot already about the ideas of rotating. And um, Nate Kamelke's uh, work on that uh, was really groundbreaking. Um, a number of years ago, and, and I'm sure we'll see experiments like that, also in microscopes, for example, uh, where you could then really measure the correlation functions between different uh, particles directly. So that's one approach. Another approach is the idea that you can engineer uh, complex tunneling in, uh, in the Hubbard model. So this is um, it's the Bose-Hubbard model, where you have tunneling and, and interaction. This interaction can be strong. But the nice thing is, uh, there are ways to uh, to implement to make this tunneling complex, right? And then you can actually create 
um, effective flux, as I, uh, I will be showing you. Uh, the pioneering um, experimental work on this was done at MIT in the group of Wolfgang Ketterle and in <laughs> Sonic also in uh, by Monica here and uh, um, um, and colleagues. And yeah, as I said, the basic idea is uh, this uh, tunneling becomes complex. How can I uh, how can I think about that? How um, how does it help me? The um, the idea is that if I have a magnetic field, uh, if I if I uh, uh, if I follow a loop, essentially uh, uh, the um, uh, um, I get a certain phase shift corresponding to the area um, of that loop, and uh, and so I can I can realize an effective magnetic field then by choosing these uh, complex tunneling amplitudes uh, um, accordingly, and uh, um, and with that you can also set a particular flux uh, per uh, per bracket. If they're nearly real, then it's a very small flux, right? And that's actually the situation that you have in actual condensed uh, matter physics, where the, where, the, uh, where the flux per placket is actually usually very small. Uh, but here the nice thing is since we, uh, if we find a way to arbitrarily, to arbitrarily choose the flux, then we can also get very large fluxes. And this is a regime that's uh, hard or, uh, to my knowledge, impossible to read so far in condensed matter physics unless you play tricks with like super lattices or so. Uh, okay, how can we create this, uh, this tunneling um, normally, uh, the tunneling is always real, so um, atoms just tunnel in the lattice. But the trick is we can tilt the lattice. And if you tilt, the first thing, uh, and the lattice is deep enough that you're in a tight binding model, then uh, the first thing that happens is that the tunneling is suppressed, because energetically it's not allowed to tunnel anymore. It's kind of like, uh, like I showed you the Bloch oscillation in the beginning. If I tilt a lot, the amplitude of that uh, shrinks all the way to a single lattice side, and the particle just stays on that side. Okay. But now I can reintroduce a tunneling process here by effectively shaking the lattice, or I call that photon assisted tunneling, uh, uh, which gives you the energy, uh, which absorbs or, 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 or gives you the energy to tunnel up and down um, this ladder essentially. Uh, in the experiment, uh, this can, uh, right. if you just shake it globally, then you just have a, um, a real tunneling again. But um, as Monica described already yesterday, if you, have, uh, if you shake it in a way that the lattice sides are out of sync, uh, then you can get a complex valued uh, tunneling. And so you see this, uh, if you add this kind of Raman beam to this lattice, the uh, total potential looks like this. And so there are two pictures you can view about it as a photon assisted tunneling or you view about it kind of like at certain times there's tunneling and that's out of sync uh, kind of an effective model. It depends on the tunneling strength, which is your best uh, kind of model for that. Okay. Okay. So we can, we can implement this in the experiment. Let's see if, if this gives us nice tunneling. The, the best way to, uh, uh, to do this in our case is to look at quantum walk. Uh, and we did this in, um, in different instances, but the basic idea is, again, we have a row of atoms here with this gauge field applied, and then we only let them tunnel horizontally, but we can either let them tunnel in, in a normal situ uh, with normal tunneling or with complex number tunneling, and so this would look like this, and what we then measure is, uh, what we get is um, a perfectly looking uh, quantum walk here, very coherent, uh, or here you can see, uh, if you compare it to a Bessel function, how it looks like. It turns out, of course, in 1D, this complex value tunneling doesn't make any difference. It only makes a difference if atoms are able to go on a loop, right? So this looks just like a regular uh, uh, quantum walk, okay? Um, the, the tunneling, uh, the shaking also affects the other direction. So this is the tunneling strength in the tilted direction versus shaking strength, and the tunneling strength in the non-tilted direction uh, also goes down and even changes signed. Um, uh, change the sign, but um, this we don't really want, so we would work somewhere here where we have a significant tunneling along the tilted lattice and the tunneling hasn't been really affected so much in the other direction. Right. Okay, so we recently did a lot of experiments with ladders uh, because there we were able to uh, to measure entanglement entropy and so on. I'll mention that later. So we had the system ready uh, to go, and this is actually, it's kind of a nice toy system for this. 
uh, because we can now do um, experiments where, for example, we delocalize exactly one particle on the ladder, and then we see how this particle would perform a quantum walk. Right? Um, let's first assume a situation where the tunneling is real, so there's no gauge field. In this case, it's actually, the problem is separable in x and y, and if you, if you do a quantum walk, you would just see the particle perform a, a regular quantum walk, Bessel function, kind of in the x direction, and nothing happens in the y direction. But what happens if we now add a gauge field to this situation? Kind of, like again, here this means I have delocalized one atom over the two, so there's, uh, uh, there's, uh, there's only, there's no a little uh, 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 transverse momentum. Okay, now uh, what would happen with a gauge field? With a gauge field, you would actually expect that uh, the part of the wave function that travels to the left and the right, they would now experience a Lorentz force. And then it should look asymmetric here. They, if, um, essentially, they do something like experiencing a Lorentz force and then doing kind of like uh, skipping orbits. I should mention there's some really nice work uh, uh, in synthetic dimensions on this, uh, uh, but which, uh, which gets very similar results. OK, let's see uh, and what we get if we do this in the latter. Yeah, so, so this, we have the Lorentz force and then the skipping orbit. Let's see what we observe if we do this uh, in the latter, so we, what, what I'm plotting here is um, I'm starting here, uh, delocalized between these two sides, and then I'm measuring as a function of time uh, the, vertical, uh, the vertical center of mass uh, depend, uh, dependent on whether the particles move to the left or the right. Okay. So kind of the time evolution goes like this, and what I find is that the, uh, the particle starts moving uh, uh, so this axis is time, uh, positive in both directions. This is if the particle goes to the right, I, I plot it here. If it goes to the left, I plot it here. And uh, um, what you see is that the particle, in fact, goes, uh, uh, and the y-axis is uh, the position. So, so uh, uh, plus 0.5 would be up, and minus 0.5 uh, would be at the, lower, uh, at, the, um, at the lower position. And I see a pretty strong amplitude here that uh, the particle, indeed, experiences the, the lowest force and goes to the side, but then oscillates, yeah? Or, and if it goes in this direction, it goes to the opposite side and then oscillates. Right? Without a gauge, gauge field, but some initial momentum, it would just oscillate on both sides simultaneously. But here, because of the gauge fields, it goes in opposite directions. So this is kind of like, I don't want to over uh, 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 stress analogy, it's, it's only a ladder, but it looks a lot like uh, these kind of uh, skipping orbits that you would uh, that you would expect. Okay, so that's nice. Uh, in particular, it looks exactly like the theory, so uh, uh, which is nice because it means it's it's very coherent and and, uh, and and we know what we're doing. But how about uh, now adding interaction? Because the nice thing is here we are in the bose hubbard system where we can have very uh, strong in, um, interaction. What happens uh, if we do this? Uh, uh, yeah, so th the nice thing is we can do that. Let's assume, for example, we put two particles on two neighboring sides onto one, um, onto one rung here that are strongly repulsive. Well, let's actually first assume that they're non-interacting. Okay? Uh, unfortunately, we can't do this in the experiment because, um, ironically, uh, it's hard to turn off that interaction for us. Uh, it's the opposite case than photons, I guess. Um, so if they are strongly, uh, uh, sorry, it, if they weren't strongly interacting and I have the gauge field on, for symmetry reason, they would actually uh, travel symmetrically. There would be no uh, vertical oscillation here. Right? There would be no uh, kind of Lorentz force kind of pattern because depending, the two atoms do exactly the opposite, essentially. With interaction, surprisingly, this picture changes. Uh, so, uh, 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 right, and if I simulate, I don't have data here, but if I simulate it, I would expect no oscillation whatsoever. But with interaction, it's different. If I have the same situation with strong interaction, it looks completely different. It, it would actually look, um, uh, we would recover these kind of orbits uh, hand-wavingly because they go in opposite directions. Uh, so this is a strong qualitative signature that the interaction is essential here because without interaction, you wouldn't see any, uh, anything. So let's see what we see experimentally. Experimentally. Uh, right, it looks like this, and, and, and you see already, so you see already, as they move, you, they populate the opposite uh, sides here. So in fact, uh, 
it, if you plot this, it looks again exactly like what you would calculate. Luckily, we can still calculate this here. Um, and you would see uh, this oscillation. Again, with no interaction, it would be a flat line, but with interaction, uh, you get this distinct oscillation again. So the strong interaction is, is essential here, and luckily, uh, this actually works uh, quite well. What I should, um, what I should uh, mention is one feature. The big thing you're fighting against is always heating. So here we were very careful to try to find a hierarchy of energy scales that avoids that as well as possible, right? Um, the, uh, there's always still some finite heating. Luckily, for these, in the quantum gas microscope, we can post-select on cases where there wasn't any heating. There is a finite probability to end up in the higher band, but if this atom adds up, uh, if one of the two atoms adds up in the higher band, it's actually going to be lost. And we can post-select on, only on cases where we have still two atoms at the end. In this case, it's about t t t uh, in ten, like after 30 milliseconds, after the full time, it's about a t t t t 10 to 15 percent probability to ha uh, having lost one, but we just discard that. So there's a, an order of 5 percent probability per atom uh, to get lost. But, but this means we can still scale this up to 10, 20 particles, and we still have a pretty, or we should be able to scale this up, and uh, so we are very curious now to see what happens, and should be able to post-select uh, and make sure that we don't count events where we actually had heating. So we can, via post-selection, kind of effectively lowering, um, lower the heating rate. Of course, this wouldn't work with 1,000 particles, right? But um, I'm, I'm quite optimistic that the microscope also helps us in this, uh, um, in this way. Uh, yeah. That's a very interesting question. It's often very confusing, this non-measurement of, uh, I wonder if, if, that, if that shows up. Um, intuitively, I would expect not in the sense that it would affect this. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I don't know the answer. I would, I, I would expect that it gives you the same dynamics, but it, but you could turn it around and actually ask, what could you construct the situation where that leads to interesting physics? Yeah, that's true. Okay. For instance, if you have a standing wave of light mm -hmm. and you observe that an atom is not scattered in light, mm -hmm. you know the atom is more right. likely mm -hmm. exactly. that the end time of the nodes and not at the end time nodes. Right. So that well, this ties into the puzzle. What's, how do you understand? The um, is that revealing is completely unstructured. I'm not sure if the fact that an atom has not been heated has any implication. But for instance, if you have the heating mode on, every on, on one side, side or so, yeah, yeah. Then you right. Hmm? Right. Hmm? right, right, right. Okay. Um, what's nice about the microscope is this Raman lattice to make uh, the light. We can also we can also tune continuously. We just move a beam in the in the Fourier plane. Um, Eric, who's, uh, who's in the audience, he built a, a great system with like piezo mirrors and so on, where in real time we just we can move the direction of the of the beams, creating the Raman lattice. Within a millisecond or so, they could just uh, uh, change position. So this means we can sweep the uh, uh, we can sweep the magnetic field on or off. We could also create uh, with a slightly more fancy optics. We could create inhomogeneous fields. Or certainly also AC fields, okay? Or and AC fields with, with finite wave factor. It's had an interesting discussion about. Okay, and uh, but let's just look here. Uh, for example, uh, if you have now pi third flux per placket, it looks kind of a bit different. Uh, still similar, you still get the oscillation. And if you invert the flux, we can also get minus pi third, and you see uh, it looks exactly opposite. So that's uh, that's nice uh, to see. This all makes sense. Um, if it's pi, there's no oscillation at all. Right, um, it's kind of an interesting case where you know it, you have no obviously chiral behavior, but but uh, as I mentioned in a minute, this is actually an interesting uh, uh, flux per placket situation. Uh, uh, but if we uh, we can also vary it, let me measure, let me plot kind of the amplitude of this oscillation here uh, uh, as a function of of magnetic field, 
And then uh, uh, um, we can see here uh, how, as we vary uh, the flux per placket here, uh, I see that this oscillation amplitude goes up and down again at pi to zero and in a symmetric fashion on the other side, right? Okay, so we can, we can choose this, we can even dynamically ch uh, uh, choose this. Um, one interesting thing we are very eager to try out now is we should have all the tools ready to just, for example, create a, a ladder with pi flux, but initialize it with a mod insulator uh, and then turn on these, uh, these tunnelings. There's a great proposal that we'll also hear about in the next, um, 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 in the next talk by, uh, by Arun. Um, uh, the, the, the idea is that you should be able to create a chiral superfluid and chiral mod insulator if you have like a, p a pi flux per, 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 per placket here. Uh, the basic idea of this is that in a chiral superfluid, you kind of have a mod insulator. I don't have time to talk details, but the, the kind of a mod insulator of vortices. And in a chiral mod insulator, you have kind of a superfluid of vortices. So these vortices becomes, become delocalized, right? Uh, which, of course, is also, again, related to Loveland physics kind of. And, or, okay. Uh, and, uh, uh, okay. Now, we could probably do it. How would we measure that we have those states? The great thing, for fermions, huh? Just for this is bosonic system. The what? Agun's calculations for fermions, the bosons. No, for, for, mm, uh, it's for bosons, yeah. Um, the, the, the nice thing is that in this ladder, we can directly measure the currents on the runs by just interfering the two lattice sites. It's like a double well each, each, each run, and by, by letting them tunnel for uh, a quarter uh, period, uh, we can measure the, the current on that rung in a single shot, single side level. So these kind of states, they should show up in the correlation of uh, the currents. Like, for example, you would not see any net current, but you would see, you would see alternating correlations in currents. That would be kind of um, um, smoking gun signatures of these uh, phases. And so, uh, yeah, um, let's see how that works. Uh, we have to hope that the heating is small enough, but it looks, everything looks very good right now. Uh, other ideas, for example, five by five, put a few particles on and hope to see Lovelin uh, states. Um, Fabian has done some uh, nice calculations recently to show uh, nice pathways, how one could get to Fafian or Lovelin states in these kind of situations. The, uh, uh, the, uh, this would make use of, again, our uh, ability to dynamically change the flux per placket and also some harmonic confinement, for example. But there's, uh, I, I mean, there are many ideas how one could play with that. And then you could choose a, a, a path here, right? So like sweep on the B field, but go on the right trajectory here. Let me just briefly determine uh, how much time do I have left? Um, I'll <laughs> tell you in a moment. Just okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let, me, uh, um, let me briefly talk about some other uh, uh, work that relates to the topological uh, the topological states of matter and so on, and show you some other um, um, abilities that, um, and tools that we have. Oh, wow, okay, cool. Um, the, uh, so so um, the work I'll be talking um, about next, Rajibul was uh, really uh, uh, pushing these ideas to measure entanglement entropy in, in our lab, and um, the team was pretty much the same, um, 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 right, except Alex was uh, uh, still here and also pushing a lot on these experiments. He's also in the audience, and you heard um, him mentioned a number of times in John's talk before, where he's now doing great things with photons. Um, the, uh, uh, right, so the basic idea here is that, um, as you all know, entanglement entropy seems to be a very interesting measure, uh, well, actually for all kinds of things, but particularly also to detect um, exotic states of matter where you don't have uh, any, um, any other simple broken symmetry or so. So uh, looking at entanglement entropy should give you, uh, uh, could, should give you um, kind of a tool to really detect the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, in the, uh, uh, through the topo uh, uh, topological effects. The problem is that in traditional condensed matter physics, one, one wouldn't really know how to measure entanglement entropy. And uh, that's actually a pretty uh, 
uh, a deep uh, reason uh, for that, as, as I will tell you in a moment. In fact, for I would say for a single system, you shouldn't be able to measure entanglement entropy. I'll tell you why in a minute. So for uh, people not so familiar with, the, uh, with this topic, let me just tell you real quick, what do I mean by entanglement entropy and why is this a measure for entanglement? The, uh, so the goal here is to, to measure, to quantify entanglement in, in a many-body system. Uh, many of you in the cold atom community are more familiar with entanglement in, in a spin system, for example, like a bell pair of spin states. It turns out you can also go to itinerant systems where particles move around. And then a, delo a particle that's delocalized between you and me in, in many ways looks exactly the same as a, uh, as a bell state. In fact, I could view a bell state of two spins, uh, independent of what basis you measure, you always find opposite outcome. I could view this as a delocalized spin excitation. One spin excitation delocalized between you and me, okay, in a coherent fashion, and then it's uh, entanglement, essentially. Uh, the same is true for these uh, uh, itinerant uh, particles. How do I measure it then? Uh, the, the trick here is to uh, measure bipartite entanglement, meaning if I cut the system into two, uh, can I write it? Can, can, can I write my state in in the product state of region A and B? And um, uh, if I can write it as a product state of A and B, and I trace over B, it doesn't change anything uh, to A. And if this was a pure state to begin with, this will still be a pure state because it's just the product state. I trace over this. I uh, have the state A left. This entanglement now, this is really, uh, if there's entanglement here, entanglement I view kind of as, um, uh, as uh, the rejection of local reality, essentially, meaning you cannot, if there's entanglement, then you cannot write any quantum state of view or consider a quantum state just locally. You really have to take the non-locality into, uh, um, uh, into consideration. And so if it's not, if it cannot be written as a product state, uh, if there is entanglement, then it cannot be written as a product state. And that means if I trace over B, uh, my state A is not a pure state anymore. I need a density matrix to describe it. It's now in a statistical mixture of different uh, possibilities if I have traced over, over B. Okay. So the, uh, uh, right. So this amount of mixedness here is now proportional to the amount of entanglement. That's the idea. If there's no entanglement, it's not mixed at all. If there's entanglement, then the mixedness of a subsystem increases proportionally to how much entanglement there is. So this is a nice measure for, for entanglement. Uh, how do we quantify mixedness? Well, the, the most uh, straightforward way is to just uh, look at the purity, right? Trace of rho squared. Um, and then the, uh, we can define second order Rainy entropy, which is minus the logarithm of the purity. This comes close, but is not exactly, unfortunately, the von Neumann entropy, which would be trace rho log rho. Uh, but, um, I mean, this is, of course, even more beautifully theoretically, but even less feasible <laughs> experimentally. So uh, this is a pretty good, uh, uh, but this is a great thing to work with. Um, and, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so, okay, but how can we measure the purity of, of a state? Well, first of all, uh, I would say you cannot, you can in principle not measure the purity of a state. This is not an observable. An observable is always linear in the density matrix, right? So trace of rho times A is the observable, uh, right? This is rho squared, it's, so it's not measurable even in principle, okay? Bad news. Well, we can, we can play a trick, and this trick is actually played in theoretical uh, f f f physics quite a bit. If we bring interference into uh, the game, then it's possible again. If you have two quantum systems and you interfere them, right, and uh, what do I mean by this? In our case, this could be something similar to Hongo Mandel interference of photons, beam splitter. Uh, theoretically, it's just a discrete Fourier transform between two systems. Right? If you have two systems, you interfere them, amazingly, you get only even numbers out on both sides after, after this uh, beam splitter that interferes. Uh, and all the amplitudes where you just have one particle here, uh, or where you have odd particle numbers, they disappear. They disappear exactly if these are bosons, and 
if these two states are indistinguishable. So what we're measuring here is, are these two states indistinguishable? This is a really powerful tool. If I give you too many body states and ask them, are they the same, how would you ever answer that? Uh, here's a simple recipe, and really the only recipe I could think of is to interfere them, and if they're indistinguishable, then you always get even particle numbers on both sides. Work, um, also works with fermions in a slightly modified scheme. Uh, so that's genuine many-body interference, very different from just light interference, uh, like laser light interference. It's the, the single photon interference in Hongo Mandel is the two-particle and uh, uh, the two-particle limit of this. Okay. Now, the outcome is beautiful. The average parity here is just giving you the quantum state overlap, trace of row one, row two, right? The quantum state overlap is the parity. Now, if I say the two are supposed to be the same, then this tells me how pure they are, right? Because the quantum state overlap if the two are the same is trace of rho square. That's the purity. So if I, if, I, if I prepare two samples that are identical, many body interfere them, and look at the parity, I get the purity. And that's huge. For a single system, I could never do that. It's many body interference that allows me to do that. Of course, this could also be useful for all kind of other things, uh, uh, like two-time correlation function or uh, whenever you would be interested in a quantum state overlap. Okay, this is just a crazy idea. Can we do it? Turns out we can do it. I don't have time to go into details. Basically, we prepare two quantum states next to each other, four particles. Now we do six particles often. Then we interfere them uh, with each other. We can do this in a double well, kind of. And then we can look at, uh, uh, we see, uh, we see beautiful oscillations between, uh, for example, 1, 1 particles, 0, 2 plus 2, 0. This is the, the famous Hongu Mandel. Uh, but, uh, but this really acts as a many-body beam splitter. And if you then look at the, at the outcomes here, we can measure uh, uh, the purity globally and locally. For example, if this is a, a product state, mod insulator, we find that globally and locally, we get even numbers. Globally and locally, we have a pure state. But for if we delocalize the particles, it's much more complex. Now, locally, we find odd or even. So the purity is low locally. But globally, we always find even. So the, 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 uh, um, the many-body state is pure. Uh, and, uh, and this is very non-trivial. If you change any many-body phase here, uh, this would not happen anymore. You would not get these even particle numbers globally. So, yeah, I don't have time to talk into detail. In any case, we can then use this to plot the entanglement entropy directly. Here, for example, for a transition from a mod insulator to a superfluid, and what you see is, uh, so red is the global purity or a, a global Rennie entropy, uh, and blue and green are the local ones. So for mud insulator, you're more pure locally uh, because there's no entanglement. But for these delocalized particles, then uh, your state is more pure, the global state is more pure than if you take just part of the state. And, uh, and uh, yeah, the global state is pure, part of uh, the state is very mixed. So that's entanglement entropy. Okay. Um, we've recently done work where we uh, applied this to thermalization, for example. But, uh, okay, um, let me just say that we can measure entanglement entropy as, as, a, uh, uh, kind of as a function of a volume. This is the fractional volume. This is six sides. Uh, the total system is six sides. And you see, for example, different scalings now. For a ground state, like a superfluid, you see kind of like, a log, um, like an area law. Uh, it just goes up and it's pretty much flat. Uh, with a slight logarithmic correction, what you would expect for a Bose-Einstein condensate. For a thermal, st uh, for a uh, quench state, uh, you find that you, you find a volume law, entanglement entropy here, uh, which looks for small system of one or two, looks exactly like what you would expect in terms of thermodynamic entropy here. Right? But then, as you make your system bigger and bigger again, all the entropy goes down again. Uh, so this is uh, work on thermalization. It's actually uh, uh, really fascinating. Essentially, the, uh, the story here is you can uh, probably, it, uh, it seems with eigenstate thermalization hypothesis and so on, you can develop a microscopic model for statistical physics based on these quantum mechanics ideas. Um, yeah, have a look at this paper if you would like to learn more about that. In the last two minutes, let me just uh, show, uh, we have a second experiment that uh, 
that this team has been building or uh, uh, that part of the team has been building over the last about eight years. And finally, uh, uh, we got it to work. So this is a lithium quantum gas microscope. We have fermionic particles uh, in this uh, quantum gas microscope. Uh, the, uh, in fact, last year was the year of the fermionic quantum gas microscopes. There were six different uh, ones that showed the first uh, uh, pictures. Of course, here, these are mostly thermal, except uh, for a band insulator here. Uh, the next step was to make it cold. So here's a, here's a fermionic mod insulator in the Fermi-Hubbard model. Uh, yeah, as I said, the model is a Fermi-Hubbard model, so it's interesting because it has a close, uh, it's expected to have a similar phase diagram to what you have in cuprates or so. And, uh, um, 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 right, um, so uh, the spring in our group and in Martin Zwirland's group, we uh, were able to, to explore the higher temperature phases of this, uh, of this model. Here we look at charge and we find metal, metallic phases, mod insulating phases, and band insulating phases. Uh, once you get colder, of course, the, the, uh, the magnetism becomes important in the Hubbard model and gives rise to anti-ferromagnetic correlations. Uh, so here are pictures where we uh, just look at charge, up or down, but if we just look at one of the spin states, we now see these anti-ferromagnetic correlations uh, occur, as you see here. Uh, we can measure the, the profiles of the correlations uh, over the cloud and things like that. And just recently, so it, uh, we're really excited. We get to colder and colder temperatures here, and uh, this all looks, looks extremely promising. Uh, briefly afterwards, also in, uh, um, in Emmanuel Bloch's group in 1D and Martin's group in 2D has similar, uh, has similar results. And then we, uh, right. And just to close the circle, so this would, of course, also be great to implement gauge fields in uh, and so on. So uh, uh, these fermionic systems are really promising. Uh, and then you can also use the microscope to do dynamics, uh, local dynamics. For example, this is a quantum work of a hole or a quantum work of two holes in the Fermi-Hubbard model. That's very non-trivial motion. Uh, and here we see strong anti-correlation between the holes. Uh, and this, unfortunately, is not visible. This is 2D quantum work. Just as a uh, just flashing as brief outlook, so there are lots and lots of tools available now, and uh, it's a really exciting time. Okay, um, um, with that, I would really like to, to, to thank all the um, all um, all the students and postdocs and collaborators. Uh, also, John Simon actually uh, did uh, the first version of this um, Harper Hamiltonian in our uh, experiment a long time ago, and so recently we dug that out again, <laughs> and uh, uh, the. Uh, yeah, so um, and all the funding agencies um, and th 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 thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let's just see, the, in the picture I showed you, the, the gap size was 0 0.1, 0 0.2 uh, of the tunneling, right? So it's, that's not so bad. Um, uh, yeah, in fact, that's quite good. So yeah, that's all I can say so far. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on site interaction. Yeah, right. No, it cannot be right. It's you just you just forbid the amplitude. You forbid all paths where two particles are on top of each other, essentially. Yes, that, that's, that's enough to make it completely look different, this oscillation. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting, to, to, I don't fully understand yet when that, is, can that, when that can be the case and when not, uh, uh, because um, it's a bit of a subtle question, because it's, it's more like a super exchange kind of, but, but 
yeah, I'm just thinking about it that certain paths are eliminated essentially. But I think this would be nice to understand a bit more qualitatively. Marcus, so for the latter experiment, you, you have two particles so far? Or, or you... Yeah, we have two so far. Um, but it, but I mean, but we could have many. So if, that's. If, if for more particles, you attempt to measure uh, edge currents, then you use momentum distributions, or what? what what's the plan? I mean, at edge. So what we could measure is currents along the runs um. by interfering the two, just doing a discrete Fourier transform between the two, the top and the bottom, essentially, and then you see. But then, you, then instead of having the position plotted, you would have the current plotted. Last question related to, to, to I think to, to, to Wolfgang's comment. So it, I think the, what the issue would be that uh, here you analyze a model, assuming you have the lowest band. So the question is whether when you mm -hmm. when you when you select the, uh, the, the your post select then whether yeah. whether during the dynamics uh, for, for that sample during the process that there's a excess from a higher band. And so yeah. so what are are there ways to determine? So. So we can, I mean, we can determine whether it got into the higher band because then it's lost. No, no, but, but, but and and I think that's all. I think that's all totally fine to do post selection like that. But let's talk about it and 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 try to understand it better. I don't I don't know more about that at this point. Yeah. Do you have a, a comment or um, Adam? Do you have a comment? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So in the Fermi habit now, or no? Sorry, in the latter. Yeah. So should I think of them as the superposition of the of being the superposition? The holes or particles? The particles. Ah, yeah. Of being the superposition of different uh, magnetic bands when they go. I mean, whatever the initial state you prepare is, and there's actually quite some flexibility, and you could prepare different states. <laughs> And in particular, in, in conjunction to sweeping B fields and so on, you could actually do interesting things there. Right now, we just, we just started uh, with a particle delocalized over the two ladders. There's some subtleties, actually, because uh, in the, like, once you turn on your, your, your floquet uh, kind of picture, what, what we do is we actually sweep it, kind of. So, so it's, um, um, 